All right, well, let's get into it. We already kind of saw this typical cross-section here. Uh, one thing we want to talk about today is that <clears throat> we're kind of at an interesting uh, impasse here in the paver industry where there are some big changes coming down the line, stuff like pre-sealed pavers, right? Uh, that's a great value for your client when you start talking about the paver only talking, you know, costing an extra dollar per square foot. You start comparing that to the cost to clean and seal and um, it becomes a, a really great value. So that's a huge innovation that just kind of came about last year. We're also starting to talk more about using hybrid paver systems. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about when I say hybrid paver systems? Yeah, so, you know, a couple of you guys are familiar with it, but, um, you know, one thing that we've been looking at in the industry is moving from a three-quarter minus base material for pavers, which has been the traditional base material for pavers for uh, infinity, right, since forever. We're starting to look at using more of a three-quarter clear, open-graded paver base, even with a traditional paver top where you can still use permeable sand to fill the joints. A couple of reasons that we're looking at doing that is because open graded three quarter clear rock doesn't hold moisture the same way that three quarter minus does, right? And whatever doesn't hold moisture isn't gonna heave the same way either. And so there's a couple of extra considerations that you have to make if you're gonna try to use three quarter clear as a base material opposed to three quarter minus. So if we look here at our cross section, what we see is that we've gotten, sorry, my laser's not gonna work, but what we see here is we've got, uh, starting at the very bottom, that's how every project starts, we would start at the bottom and work our way up. So, starting at the bottom here, you can see that what they are specking on the paver install is gonna be um, a geosynthetic underlayment fabric. How many of you guys are using that under pavers? Awesome. It's not, uh, it's not an extra for me anymore either. It's just the way. And really it has to do with the fact that Minnesota has real high clay content, right? A lot of projects that we're installing are in heavy clay. And whenever you're working in heavy clay, there's a good chance that you're going to see that clay mix with your base material, right? And whenever you see that mix happen, you know that the structural integrity of your base has been compromised, right? You get some kind of rock soup. If you've ever pulled up an old paver job that's heaving or, uh, you know, had problems, you know that what you can end up with sometimes under those pavers is just kind of a rock soup, right? Where it's dirt mixed with sand, mixed with class five. Uh, very seldom do those older installations keep that base material pure. So we like to see a, a geosynthetic separator down there. It's cheap insurance against warranty work, right? And for us, for me, what does warranty work mean? It means you're working for free. I hate working for free, so we take every cheap insurance route that we can on the front end of these projects to make sure that we don't have to go back and work for free a year or two later. We warranty our pavers against heave for five years. You know, some companies I know do it for three years. Three to five is pretty standard uh, because of the lifespan of the polymeric sand that we use on top. Now, three-quarter minus is the traditional base material that we see compacted in for uh, pedestrian applications like your paver patios, your walkways. That's gonna typically be four to six inches thick, right? So when we're setting up our paver base, we dump in two to three inches, we call that rough grade. We dump in two to three inches over the whole thing, we'll get out the wide rake, kind of rake it out as flat as we can get it. We're really not super concerned at this point with the final grade, the top because all we want to do is we want to compact that first lift and make sure that we have proper compaction under our pavers. So the next step is going to be to set final grade. That's what you see manifest up at top there. That's what we screen our sand over is final grade, right? So then you're going to, you're going to set final grade. You're probably going to use something like a laser transit over here, maybe a zip line level. How many of you guys have used zip line levels? Fantastic. Those are awesome, right? It's a really great way to set up paver base. Zipline level just tells you exactly what kind of span you have. And you know, we're typically looking for about a 3% slope on these pavers, which equates to about an inch over 10 feet of drop. And that's gonna make sure that we shed water off the edge of the patio. 
So you may use a zip line level, laser transit. I know some guys are still on small patios, especially just using a string line and a level to uh, set up proper grade, compact that in. And then we're gonna screen our sand back. One thing I wanna mention is, you know, when you're, when you're setting up your screed pipes, first of all, what kind of pipes do you wanna use? Do you wanna buy some PVC pipes? You don't, want to, you don't want to use PVC pipes, right? Because if there's any imperfection in your base material, that PVC pipe is just going to bend over that hump, and you're going to end up with that hump manifesting at, at the top of your paver surface. So I always recommend using the thicker electrical conduit, not the cheap stuff that uh, is real thin and bends easily, but the kind of stuff that we have over here is a really nice, thick electrical conduit that doesn't bend easily. It's going to stay rigid over your base, um, I know some guys are using, you know, a full inch of bedding sand. With our company, we actually opted in to start using just a half inch of bedding sand. I think it helps you keep you a little bit more honest with your base material. Tolerances are a little bit tighter with that, but you end up with a better final product. At some point, most of that sand is going to erode and wash out from underneath your pavers, which means your pavers are going to always look like that class 5 base. The pavers aren't going to always have that, that nice little sand buffer to keep them perfect. So spending the time to get your base material right is time well spent. If we look again here, we see that the pavers are up on top. We're going to go ahead and lay those pavers in, and then we're going to uh, run a plate compactor over the top of them, right? And it seems a little bit counterintuitive. But when you run that plate compactor over the top of your pavers after you've laid them, you do a couple of things. You seat them in to your bedding sand, first of all, and second of all, you achieve a level of uniformity that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. When the plate packer runs over the pavers, it goes from minor inconsistencies that you can see on your surface to like glass, right? And that's what we want to see is a nice, flat, perfect top surface. Once you do that, we're going to fill that joint with a polymeric sand. Silica sand, when I first got started, got started in this industry, was an upgrade. We used to use regular uh, wash sand in the joints, right? So that used to be like an upgrade if you want to spend some extra money. Again, it's just the way now. I think everybody's using silica sand or some, some type of polymeric sand, gator dust, whatever it is, to fill those joints up. And by the way, the technology behind the polymeric sand has come a long ways over the last five or ten years. Um, it's finer, it's smaller now, it fits into tighter cracks, it seals up better. I think we see the lifespan on polymeric sand lasting more like five years now opposed to three years which is kind of true across the industry. All the chemicals, from sealers to the pavers to the egg mixes, everything has come a long way, you know, thanks to this whole technology thing over the last five or 10 years. So, um, you know, use the newest stuff that you can. Find the, find the new polymeric sand that's gonna get in those joints. I know dustless technology has become a big thing over the last few years. You wanna make sure that you're not exposing yourself or your guys to that silica dust, right? Sometimes that's easy if you're working out on a patio where you have good airflow, but sometimes if you're in a cramped space, it's a little bit tougher, right? You might start seeing that dust come up and settle around you and you're you know, breathing it in. At that point, you want to use some sort of a respirator. Last thing I want to mention on the paver cross section here is that we see our plastic edge restraint. It doesn't have to be plastic, you can use metal, um, but you need some sort of an edge restraint that's going to lock into your paver base and make a positive connection with your three-quarter minus base material there. You can see that we overbase our pavers by about a foot all the way around the patio. We do that for a couple of reasons. One is edge stability. The other is edge restraint right? Because we want to make sure our edge restraint's not getting pounded into clay or dirt, something that's going to heave and move a lot. Um, and that's one thing that we've seen in the industry is that sometimes that edging wants to pop up on you a little bit, especially through, you know, three, four years of freeze-thaw cycles. So there's some new innovations out there. Always be keeping your ears open and watching the industry to see what's available. I know there's spikes that have a little curve to them now to make sure that you're going in at an angle, so it's harder to pull straight up on that edging. But, um, you know, keep your eyes open in the industry, see what else is out there. Uh, we use SnapEdge. It's something that I've used for, you know, 15 or 20 years now. It's been a great product for me. You just got to make sure it's done the right way. Okay. 
Now let me back up here. I spent some time already talking about the uh, silica sand. One thing that we want to, um, you know, just touch on is that there is an optimal joint sand level. And when I was getting started out, um, guys like Bert Plett, you know, were giving me tips, right? They'd look at my project or they'd come out and visit a job site and go, dude, you might be filling that joint a little bit too much, you know? And that was kind of what I had a tendency to do. You really don't want that joint sand to come up to the very tippy top of the paver. You want it at the bottom of that chamfer, right? So you can see right there, there's kind of a, a sweet spot, optimal joint sand level. And the reason that they say that that's your optimum joint sand level is because it's filled up enough where you're not gonna get weeds and ants coming through. Um, but it's also tall enough so that you're not gonna get deposits sitting in there and actually get maybe weed growth on top of your joint sand, if that makes sense. And the reason you don't want it too tall or too high is because as your pavers start to weather and water washes over them, you're gonna see irregular erosion, right? So some of the stuff where, you, where your water's running off the patio over and over consistently, you're gonna start to see that stuff erode away a little bit at the top. Other areas are gonna stay in place, so you end up with irregular joint sand. And that's something that is dictated by the ICPI, International Concrete and Paving Institute. You guys familiar with that? Anybody ICPI certified? Awesome. Yeah, I mean, NCMA and ICPI certification because there's no state licensing for guys like us that do paver patios and retaining walls. Some of the few things that you can do to add a level of legitimacy. So, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to go ahead and look into ICPI and, C and NCMA certification. So now what we're gonna do is go ahead and run through a typical job, right? Maybe you have a plan like this that you hand to your foreman or that you are going to implement on the job site. You know, you've, you've got a seven foot radius on your circle. You know that you're going to be making some cuts. I want to make one point here. One thing that I always do on the job site is I locate my downspouts and I want to make sure that I'm not dropping water directly onto my paver patio coming off the roof, right? If you do that, you know you're going to have increased moisture and heave. So what they're showing here with that dotted line is actually going to be a, um, a drain tile. That's going to be a, we call it a downspout adapter. But we're going to take that water coming off the roof, run it into a pipe, out to a pop-up emitter, and you want that pop-up emitter to be as close to the designed drain swales as you can. When I say designed drain swales, you know, every house we work at, usually on each side of the property, we see kind of a swale, right? And that's meant to push water either back towards a culvert or up towards the street. So when we're doing these pop-up emitters, be looking at those designed drain swales and try to target those. But that's one thing that I actually take time to talk with the client about too. I want the client to know that I'm thinking about a water management plan for their backyard, right? Every client is worried about, you know, you start talking about negative flow, water sitting up against the foundation. Um, <clears throat> I sell a lot of my projects that I go out and I meet with people on because I talk about water management. I talk about drainage and the dangers of not having a water management plan, right? So you got to scare people a little bit, um, share a little bit of knowledge with them. And a lot of times I've found clients are going to appreciate that, especially when they're comparing you to the other two guys that they called out to their house that didn't talk about that, right? So set yourself apart, start talking right away about water management. Now what we see here is uh, this young lady has set up a spike right in the center of her circle. We already looked at the plan. We know we've got a seven foot radius, which is gonna be a 14 foot diameter. So she's measuring out to seven feet. What I typically do is I'll drop a spike in the center of that, take a string line, and just paint a circle, right? If you're setting up for a 14 foot diameter circle, how big should your cut be? Paver cut, 16 feet, right? We're gonna oversize one foot all the way around our patio. So she's measuring out to eight feet, I would hope, to mark up the edge or the perimeter of the circle. I don't know if I can 
if we need new batteries in this thing. There we go. So again, she's marking up the perimeter. And then you can see, you know, these lines right here just denote the edge of the patio. We're going to have to clear out some rock on this one. Um, notice one thing here I just want to point out. We've got a flag that looks like it's probably marking an electrical line. Make sure that before you start digging for your paver project, call Gopher State 1. Make sure that everything is marked up. If you ever hit a gas line, you'll call every time from there forward. I actually, uh, I had a project that I was installing. It was, it was a property that was changing from a residential house to more of a commercial property. And what had happened is right before I showed up, the gas company came in and ran an, an auxiliary gas line through the side of the house. I didn't know that and neither did the good people at Gopher One. And so as I was digging out, we were doing a big permeable paver driveway. We had to dig down like 20 inches to get this done. And I was back dragging with my bobcat and I caught that gas line. And the thing pops up and I mean gas everywhere, right? And there's me blowing a heater in the bobcat. <laughs> yeah, I probably might need some new batteries. Um, and so, you know, it was, a, it was a mess because immediately I had to go run around. I had uh, four guys on the job site. I got one guy running this way down the street, one guy running this way, knocking on doors, evacuating people because if there is an explosion, <laughs> you know, everybody's got to get away. It's a disaster. What I was actually able to do is run over to the gas line. I kinked it off, taped it off, and it stayed sealed until the gas company could come and repair it. I was not held liable for that because I had called go for one on the front end and go for one did not mark that auxiliary line for me but make sure you're calling ahead to have stuff marked up that could have been a lot worse than it was way better okay once you've got everything marked up footprints marked up you bring in your machine you know your skid steer operator is going to come in and uh, start digging this material out for your uh, typical pedestrian paver patio, you're gonna take out about 10, 10 inches, right? About 10 inches of material um, that you have to displace, pull that stuff out, haul it away. One little trick that we use is we actually keep about a bucket or two of this material on site to fill back in around the edge of the patio when we're done if it's not too, too gnarly. You know, sometimes you get into some really gnarly, gross clay and you just can't reuse it. But, uh, we typically will throw a tarp down off to the side of the patio, I'll take a bucket or two of dirt, dump it on that tarp, and leave it for when we finish so we can spread it around the edges when we're done. As you're doing your dig, one thing that I like to do, especially on smaller patios, is uh, I might take a 10 foot 2 by 4 or a 12 foot 2 by 4 and run it across the base just to kind of see how uniform my base material is. I just want to make sure that I don't have weird dips, right? Where in one area my base is going to be 4 inches thick, but in another area it's 8 or 10 inches thick. You want to have some level of uniformity to your base. So if, you know, we say 4 to 6 inches, 4 to 6 inches, you got a couple inches of tolerance there, and that's a pretty good rule of thumb. You really don't want to see more than an inch or two of deep deviation in your substrate. So how do we set, how do we determine our fixed points on the patio? Well, in this, in this particular example, we've got one fixed point that we know, right? That's a hard fixed point, that door threshold. We cannot set our pavers higher than that. We also want our pavers to be lower than the siding by at least two or three inches. And that's just so that, uh, you know, mice can't crawl up in there and you don't get water splashing up over the top of the foundation. Typically about three inches off the bottom of the siding. So we do have a hard threshold there. We can't get higher than that, right? We can't run water into the garage. So, Knowing that we have one fixed point, we know that we need to run water away from the house, right? It's called positive flow. Typically on a paver patio installation, you want to see about an inch over 10 feet. So if you're putting in a patio that's going to push out into the yard, you know, 20 feet, you're probably going to have about two inches of slope running away from the house. And I always use the example, um, you know, it's sloped enough to run water off but as you're sitting out there and you set a, a glass of wine or a, you know, scotch or whatever on the table, it doesn't look kitty wampus. 
It's not sideways, right? But it's just enough slope so that it's gonna run the water off without looking weird. Okay, we already talked about we need to over excavate by one foot around the patio. So I mentioned downspouts, right? This is one way to do a downspout. How many of you guys use these, these grates? Yep, there's more than one way to do this, right? It's kind of like uh, skin and a cat. You can do this several different ways. Uh, we actually use an, uh, an adapter that goes from the either three by four or two by three downspout into a four inch round. And we actually run it straight to uh, a PVC sewer pipe. I don't use the corrugated soft pipe under a patio. Um, and and in, in all honesty, I don't ever use it. Um, we've switched over to using this, this uh, sewer pipe. It's a little bit more expensive. It's a little harder to haul around, but it does a much better job. It's more rigid. It's going to carry a load better. And it's also going to help increase flow because you don't have those ripples that are going to catch sediment, right? So um, I always like to stop here and, you know, there's more than one way to do this, but you want to make sure that you're getting the water that's coming off of the roof evacuated from your, from your work site, from your work area. So now what they're doing is they're digging a trench. The trench needs to be lower than your patio because you really don't want the, the uh, pipe to take up a portion of your base material. You don't want the pipe to be riding high on your base so that it, you know, you, you'd risk actually having that manifest at some point. As your pavers settle, freeze thaw cycles occur, the pipe's gonna stay rigid where everything else is flexing. So you, you want that pipe to be a little bit below your patio whenever possible. You can see here they're digging a rut outside the patio footprint. One little tip here I just want to point out is what they've done is they've just taken the top of the grass off and flipped it over and then done their dig. And the reason that's kind of nice is because then you can flip it right back on after you put your pipe in and you backfill over the top. Just a nice little trick. Decrease waste, increase efficiency. Okay. So I mentioned before, you know, there's a grate, you can use, um, you can use the drain grate if that's the system that you like to do, or if you want to look into using downspout adapters, that's uh, what I think is a superior way to do it. One nice reason I like using the sewer pipe is because if you're going to put a pop-up emitter down on the low side for the water to come out, you guys all know what I mean, pop-up emitter, that green disc that kind of sits flat with the grass, you can mow over it. But if you're going to use a pop-up emitter there, there's no way to make a real clean, positive connection between corrugated pipe and a PVC pop-up emitter. You can try stuff, but there's no way to make a permanent bond there. So that's one reason I like to use that, that uh, sewer pipe is because you can actually seal it up just like you would on an inside plumbing application. You use that pipe glue, you know, pipe dope, whatever you want to call it. You can glue that thing together and it's going to stay put. Then there's a good picture of the pop-up emitter. So, in this case, they had to break off a, a landing here. I'm guessing there's probably some rebar coming through there. You know, you don't have to cut that all the way down, but you do have to cut that down at the top where your pavers are going to sit because you don't want that to affect your pattern. And with new guys, um, every year, I always end up with one or two new, you know, fresh fish on my job site, right? And whenever you've got these guys, if you leave them alone, when you're making cuts, you come back and you find some pretty abstract stuff, right? I've seen guys cut the, cut the uh, soldier chorus or the sailor chorus to accommodate curves or out, you know, all kinds of goofy stuff. Don't cut your border pavers to fit around crappy concrete. Cut the crappy concrete out of the way and then your pavers are clean and perfect, right? just my where I'm standing or what's going on here okay once again use proper compaction equipment you're not going to use a big bobcat roller sheep's foot roller or something like that on patios when we're compacting sand or we're compacting gravel we want to use a vibratory plate compactor right we want to have that thing packed in nice and solid I always tell my new guys whenever you think you're done run around like 10 more times right we want to make sure that our base is compacted how do you guys test does anybody have 
a tip for me. How do you test to see if your base is packed enough? Yeah. What's that? That's right. So the plate compactor, once you're properly compacted, it should be almost like you're running it on concrete or asphalt, right? When you let go of that thing, you're going to be tingling a little bit, right? And that's one way to do it. Does anybody else have another tip? We call it the spike test. Sometimes you'll take a spike, four pound mall. You, shouldn't, you should have to really work to pound that spike in. You'll get it in, but it should feel like you're pounding through soft concrete, right? Once you get that spike to the point where it's holding in there and you can't even pull that sucker out by hand anymore, you should have to pry it out with a shovel. Once you get to that point, then you've got proper compaction. That's just in case you don't have a nuclear density tester with you on every job site. Um, spike test is a cheap way to do it. But use the proper plate compactor. Um, that guy right there is probably, I don't know, three or 4,000 pounds of force, right? It looks like a pretty small unit. It might have a six or an eight horse motor on it. Um, that one's actually probably closer to a six. So that plate compactor right there is only gonna be able to pack about two to four inches per lift probably closer to two to three. So make sure that you're setting your base up in two lifts. That's why I say we always do a two-step process with our bases. We do rough grade, and then we set final grade after that, and we pack both. As I mentioned before, this has become something that's no longer an option for my clients. I just build it into the patios now. It's cheap. You know, you might spend 100, 150 bucks on underlayment fabric to do a three or 400 square foot patio, and it's going to keep the pavers looking good. And one thing I always like to touch on is each of us, even though, you know, I talked about this a little bit yesterday, even though I run a company that does hardscape install, a lot of you guys do as well, at some level, we're competitors, but at some level, we're kind of partners too, right? We have to learn how to work together in the industry, and one of the things that I always like to pound home is using stuff like in underlayment fabric is going to keep your projects looking better longer, right? And as an industry, we're always trying to fight back against that stigma of, oh yeah, I had a patio at my old house, and it looked like crap, right? You know, when I moved out, we had to have it fixed and we put a Band-Aid on it, but there was weeds growing through it and all kinds of stuff. So, <clears throat> you know, me doing a great job on patios, believe it or not, helps everybody. Same way one of you guys doing a great job on patios or retaining wall install and setting up these sustainable projects that look great for a long time, it helps you, it helps your business, but it helps the whole industry at the same time. So use underlayment fabric. The other thing that the fabric does beyond just separator is it does act as a soil stabilizer or a soil reinforcer as well. So it's worthwhile, cheap insurance against heave or movement. See how they're running the fabric over the top of the pipe? Right, the pipe is buried underneath. You just have to make sure that you've got good positive flow on that pipe, right, so that the water's not gonna, that's another reason I don't like using corrugated pipe. It's way too easy to have one little minor dip or deviation in the ground that causes water to sit in that pipe and freeze. Whereas with a rigid system, like a sewer pipe, that never happens, right? We know that that's gonna stay, stay nice and uh, uniform. Okay, so now, We've got the loader coming in, three-quarter minus, and we said before that you can use three-quarter clear if you want to. There's advantages and disadvantages to using three-quarter clear opposed to three-quarter minus. One thing about three-quarter clear that you need to know is that when you order a yard, after you compact it, it still takes up that same volume, right? Three-quarter clear does not pack compact in on itself the same way that class two or class five does. Once you compact a yard of class five, you're probably only filling about two thirds, maybe three quarters of a yard worth of volume after compaction, okay? So when you order three quarter clear, you really don't have that same, I don't call it product loss, but really what it is is compaction, right? So you're not gonna need quite as much three quarter clear as you would class two. So that's one little advantage to using it. The other advantage to using it is that it doesn't hold moisture. So these systems are more sustainable over a long period of time. 
I've done a couple of hybrid systems where we use three-quarter clear underneath a traditional paver top. You do have to use an additional layer of fabric over your bedding sand. You have to lay that fabric over the bedding sand and that's going to keep the silica sand from washing down. We also go from a traditional bedding sand application where we're using like a washed sand to more of a chip. Granite chip or a trap chip is, is pretty typical, but we're using a different material for our bedding sand as well when we're doing these hybrid applications. But, you know, I just want to point that out. Whether it's three quarter clear, three quarter minus, you're going to bring your material back, start dumping it in. You probably got a couple of those wide rakes so the guys are going to, you know, run out and start raking it around. I don't really set up thresholds for my rough grade. You know, I don't go around and set up spikes. I probably haven't fired up my laser transit since I checked my, my original excavation. So as these guys come in and dump it, you're going to just spread it and pack it. That first rough grade really doesn't need to be perfect. It doesn't have to be dialed in the same way that your final grade does. So you're just going to spread it and then you're going to start compacting says no more than six inch lifts, ignore that. If you're using a plate compactor like this, it's no more than three inch lifts, I think, really. To be realistic, you're, you're not going to get more than three or four inches of compaction out of one of these little, you know, whackers with a six horse Honda on it. Now what he's doing is he's installing these hubs, right? These are grade stakes. The highest point is always going to be in this corner. It's always going to be in the corner where the house is. If there's no corner, it's always up against the house, right? And uh, this application, he might have actually slope running two directions. Does that make sense? Where it's going to be sloping away from the house in this direction and sloping away from the house in the, in the other direction as well. That's not a hard thing to do if you have a laser transit. You can set up slope to run things away from, uh, and actually we're going to kind of go over that when we get into our hands-on section over here as well, how you can kind of slope away from existing structures so that you're not directing water towards a house foundation or towards a hardscape feature that you've installed. So he's pounding these suckers in. He's going to use those as a guide to set up final grade now. And like I said, these aren't set up for rough grade necessarily, but once you pack in rough grade, you're going to have a nice rigid surface. He's using a nice little laser transit there to go ahead and make sure that he's got a level side to side um, orientation. And then he's going to make sure that he's got his one inch of flow coming away from the house as well. Stakes placed no further apart than the length of the screed board. Screed board right? Not the pipes. Um, whether you're using an 8-foot screed board, I mean, to be honest with you, I even, I like to use a 10 or a 12-foot 2x4 sometimes because it gets you a higher level of uniformity than a 6 or an 8-foot uh, screed would. But make sure that you're setting your spikes up so that you can screed between them. Now what they're using is a one inch or a half inch, maybe three quarter inch uh, electrical conduit. It's going to sit right on his grade spike and then it makes it real easy to just pull that grade spike or that screed bar back, whatever you're using, two by four or magnesium screed. You can pull that sucker back and as you're doing that, um, you know, you're going to see areas that maybe you don't fill completely. I, I usually like to have a guy, one guy pulling back and one guy puddling. Does everybody know what I mean when I say puddling? Anybody who's done flat work knows what that is, right? Where you're kind of taking a shovel and filling in the low spots as we go along. So we'll have one guy screening back, one guy puddling. This goes super fast, super easy. It's a really nice, efficient way to set up your paver bases, opposed to trying to rake it out and check it with string lines. which I've done. I've done both. In, on some patios, small patio applications, sometimes a string line makes more sense, right? You know what I mean? Situational awareness, right? There's different, different components to every project. Sometimes it makes sense to run a little string line, but for most of my jobs, I like to trust the laser transit uh, opposed to a string line that could be deflected on your base, right, if, if, if your rookie is doing it. So once you've compacted, or once you've run over and screeded it all perfectly flat, you're going to compact your base material again. Hit those little corners that you can't get your packer in with a, with a hand tamper, right? Get that stuff all uniform and packed in. Da, 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 da. 
Okay, now one thing I know guys don't like about these wood spikes is that over the course of time, two things happen. One is the spikes move differently than the rest of the base. So you risk having one paver end up wobbling a little bit if you leave these spikes in. They also decompose over time, so you could end up with a little teeny dip in that area. So I know a lot of guys that do pound a spike like that in, they want to remove that before they screen their sand over the top of it. Now this is something that we're actually going to do a little bit of in the hands-on section here uh, right before lunch, but you can see what, the, what he's doing here is he's set his pipes in on top of his final grade, right? And then he's just going to screen that sand back, make it nice and smooth like glass. Now you have to be a little bit careful doing this because if one of your pipes ends up sitting a little bit higher than the one next to it, you'll see that your screed starts to dig into some of that sand. And I always tell my guys, if you start to see that you're displacing sand on one side or the other, you got to stop and diagnose why that is. Why is this screed digging in and now I've got a half inch variation over here on the right side? It's usually one of two things. Either the pipe that you're working closest to is a little bit low or that other pipe was a little bit high when you screened over it or when you first set it up. So diagnose those issues as you go. Don't wait for it to become a problem where you're laying on uneven sand. Now he's going to pull these pipes up and you're left with a little divot in there, you know, a little half inch wide, you know, hole from where the pipe was. That's where I have the puddler guy back there throwing a couple handfuls of sand in there and then you just trowel that out to get it nice and smooth. See how we've got those, those lines and then you know, this one here, he'll pull that out and they'll start filling those in. I don't always fill them all in. It's not like after you pull your pipes up, you have to run through and fill every screed hole. A lot of times I'll, I'll fill the area that I'm going to start laying in. And then as I'm laying, I'll have a guy kind of puddling for me. So there's more than one way to do this. But make sure you're filling those rails in and, and kind of troweling that material out a little bit to get it nice and flat. Here we go. All right, and that's what we just talked about there. He's just trawling those areas out, and basically it's like an eraser. He's just kind of erasing those screed rail marks. Okay, so getting the pavers into the project. Um, this dude, you know, he's got a mess on his driveway now. This is something that you may have to plan on pressure washing at the end of the project if you're going to be running that much dirt and gravel over concrete. Um, but always be thinking about where you're going to stage material because in some neighborhoods it's a bigger deal than others. I mean, I live in the Burbs. I'm down in Lakeville. There's plenty of room down there. We're great wide open down there, right? But if you're working in St. Paul, Minneapolis, some of these new neighborhoods, I know there's one in Apple Valley named Cobblestone where there's like five feet between the houses. Sometimes staging material becomes a major challenge. So, I mean, when I'm going out to meet with people originally, I'm looking at all this stuff. I'm looking at my access. I want to know if I'm going to be able to get my bobcat back to the work site. I'm looking at staging capability. Where am I going to be able to put pavers? A lot of times I'll ask the client, do you mind if I set pallets on your grass for a couple days? Because there's no city, no municipality in the Twin Cities that's going to let you drop pavers on the street. Right? You're not even really supposed to drop gravel and stuff on the street. I'm not going to say I've never done it but we want to make sure we move it that same day, right? And that's not always possible with the paver delivery. So um, make sure that you're thinking about where you're going to stage materials. Expedite the delivery of the pavers. I'm always thinking about, you know, a lot of these patterns that we lay have different sizes. If it's a cobblestone, you're going to have separate pallets for the 6x9, 6x6, 3x6. This patio has a circle stone paver injected into it as well. So I'm always thinking about where's this paver going to be used when I'm bringing the, the pavers back to, to uh, stage them up for install. So, you know, be thinking about the next step as you're doing your current step, right? Kind of try to plan for success so that you don't have to bring the machine back there again and start shimmying pavers around. Think about paver placement. So we've got our excavation done. We've got our base material in. We've screened sand. This is what it should look like, right? 
Um, these guys are going to start filling in these ruts as they go. But what he's doing right now is he's, uh, he's setting up his center point for his circle. So I'm sure he's got a measurement in there that tells him exactly how far off the house the center of this circle is supposed to be. He's going to pound a spike in that spot. And that's going to be where you're going to place the very center of your circle. And I know for a lot of these, we're doing a fire pit in the middle, you know, whatever it is. Um, but you're going to always have to set up a center point for your circle because you really want to lay your circle first as the, as the, as the, uh, as the set in. You want to lay your circle first and then lay the rest of the patio out around it. There are more ways to do that, and I realize that it's not always a given rule. There's always going to be site-specific conditions that might make you do things a little bit differently. But on a typical install, you start with the circle at the center, get your center pack in, and then you're just going to stack around it. What I do sometimes is just get the center pack done, and then I'll just stand out there on that little island out there and have a guy hand me pavers. Uh, we even came up with a conveyor system at one point where we'd set up a little conveyor system, you know, a couple two-by-fours and some PVCs to expedite pavers out to the center of the patio. But whatever you can do to get the pavers out there, uh, the guy out there in the center is stuck there until the patio's done, right? Get a drink of water, go to the bathroom before you jump on that center spot because you're gonna be there for a little while. But what he's doing is he's just laying around using large circle. I believe the circle pattern is like three rows of all triangle pieces and then it starts going to like uh, the uh, rectangular pieces, every other, you know, where you're jumping, using every other piece. So in this case, the reference line is established. We're following the foundation, right? Now, one thing I always recommend doing is once you get some of your, um, your soldier course, in this case, laid out, grab one of these big squares and just check to see if the house is square. A lot of times they're not. Matter of fact, most of the time they're not square. So make sure that you're checking that and then you know if you're going to be deviating off of the foundation on one side, right, to make your paver pattern square. There's no reason to put bad on bad, right? If your house isn't completely square, that doesn't mean that you're going to start cutting little slivers in so that you can keep it snugged up to the house. I would deviate off of the foundation by up to a half an inch, fill that with silica sand before I start cutting little slugs in to fill that gap. And there's the square. Make sure that your pattern is coming out square from the house. It doesn't matter how many times you try to explain to a homeowner that, that your house foundation is crooked. Um, if your paver pattern looks crooked, you're just making excuses, right? So make sure that you're setting those things up nice and square. There's a lot of different ways to make these cuts. This is a super nice tool. We use this, we use this method a lot. One other thing that I've done when I'm going around a circle is sometimes I'll pop that center paver out. I'll put my spike and string line back directly in the center, and then I'll take it around and use that string line to go ahead and mark outside the circle. Does that make sense? I'll overlay the pattern so that I can just take my pencil and run around and make one mark all the way around on these square pavers because we're going to have to cut every square paver that makes contact with our circle. Some guys will pull those out and cut them on a miter saw. We started just cutting them in place now. Despite the fact that we wet cut, it causes a little bit of sand displacement, but it's a lot easier to fix that sand with a, with a trowel than it is to pull every paver up, individually cut it, and put it back. So you can see what they're doing right here is just making that mark. Now a guy's going to come through with the saw, saw cut, and in this case they're um, doing what I think is a little bit less efficient where they're taking it off site, cutting it, and then bringing it back for placement. The only advantage to doing it that way is that you can sometimes set aside your cut pieces and maybe reuse it. We call it braining on my job sites, right? You just kind of use your brain to get it to fit in there. You don't have to cut it anymore. But when you're doing it this way, if you're cutting with a miter saw, you certainly can um, set those pieces aside and maybe you can reuse some of that waste. Yeah, saw cutter split. 
most of the time we're going to be saw cutting on paver applications. The nice thing about being able to split the pavers is that you can create stair treads like that and maybe you're using a Versalock product that has a broke face texture and the nice thing about splitting these pavers is you get that same texture then. So splitting a paver, right place, right time, is just another tool you can put in your belt to know, hey, I don't have to always cut these, I can split them too. Oh, I just want to show this quick. This is what we refer to as field weathering, right? He's got a weathered paver there because he's made a saw cut. Now it's like a smooth line and it sticks out like a sore thumb on a weathered patio. So he's going to take a little ball hammer like this, a uh, masonry hammer, and just kind of knock the edges off so that he gets a uniform uh, texture, a uniform chamfer around the, all four edges of the paver. And this is the result. I mean, it's a really nice aesthetic to cut stuff like this in call it, you know, insetting, in cuts. It's a lot more work. Make sure that you're charging for those cuts. Don't give those cuts away. Your diamond blade's expensive. Your time is expensive. Labor's expensive. Planning these things out is expensive. Make sure that you're charging for custom work like this. I might up my price to the whole patio, you know, two or three dollars a square foot if I know I'm going to be inset cutting a, a pathway or, you know, cutting whenever you're cutting a circle into a square, right? You know that you're going to have a lot of fabrication on site. Make sure that you're charging for those cuts. Don't give it away. This thing is super uh, sketchy. Okay, so we've laid out the paver pattern. We've got our bedding sand in. Our pavers are all in. We've cut everything in. One thing I want to point out is that he's not just taking this edge restraint and just going around the edge of the patio once they're done laying the patio. What you have around the edge of the patio, once you're done laying your pavers, is irregular sand, right? It's the slough sand as you screen back that's left around the edges. You know, in some areas you might have it three inches high, other, other areas it might be more sparse. But what I always do is have a guy take a trowel and just run along there and just pull that sand back. And that's what they've done here. See these little piles? Those little piles are where they took a trowel and they pulled the sand back so that the edge restraint is making a pure connection with the class five. We're not going to have our edge restraint tipping forward or back or doing anything goofy because we're right on our uniform class five base. Ten inch spikes are the industry standard for this. We started using 12 inch spikes last year because um, you know, you get a couple of callbacks for the edge restraint. Edge restraint, you know, nature of the beast with freeze thaw cycles, you're going to see it start to heave up and that's one industry issue that I know a lot of uh, manufacturers of paver accessories have been trying to combat over the years, right? We're trying to fight that heave where it gets pushed up a little bit and then you see your edging get higher than your paver, right? And nobody likes that aesthetic, even though it may not be a structural issue, it's something that you will get calls back for. So, you know, if you can use a 12 inch spike and it costs you an extra, what, three cents per spike? Let's try that, right? Overbuild rather than underbuild. Make sure you're using them about every foot. That's what most uh, edging manufacturers recommend, is about one every three holes or two holes, depending on the span of the holes. And there we see a positive connection between the spike and the class five base. This drove me nuts when I first started installing pavers. You're telling me I'm going to get this thing perfect, dial it in, spend hours on my base, spend hours laying, screening sand, and then I'm going to run a plate packer over it. Drove me crazy, right? But the plate packer takes any abnormalities or, or uh, you know, any any uni uniform issues where one paver is sitting a little bit higher or a little bit lower and it smooths everything out. It also seats the pavers into the bedding sand so that they're going to have less tendency for horizontal slippage, right, where they're not going to want to slide around on you because they're bedded into that sand really nice and firm. So here we're using uh, silica sand. After you run the plate compactor over, you've got your edge restraint done. You're going to run your plate packer over this, then you're going to sweep in sand. If you've ever done this, you know that you're only going to get partial joint fill on your first sweep. You're never going to get that joint sand to go all the way down to the bottom on your first sweep in, right? You're always going to have weird gaps and stuff. So what you do is you sweep your sand in, 
get it all nice and uniform. Be very careful that you're not leaving a lot of sand up on tops of the pavers. Even though this isn't your final sweep in, make sure that you're getting that super clean because if you don't, when you run your plate packer over the top of the pavers, you'll scar those pavers up. You can mar the tops up a little bit, right? So, you know, pull out your little electric blower or whatever you're using to clean the tops off, give it a quick blow off before you run that plate packer back over it. Make sure that you're always packing from the low point up. You never want to push material down or from the lowest point to the highest point. You never want to push material down or up. Just make sure that you're, as you're packing these things, you start at the lowest point, work your way up to the highest point so that you're not um, causing edge deviations, I guess is the best way to kind of describe that. So after you've packed twice, right? So we've run our packer over our base twice, and then we've screened our sand, laid our pavers, done our cuts, installed our edge restraint, we've run the packer over it once, then we've swept in sand, then we're gonna run the plate packer again, and then we're gonna sweep in sand again. It's a two-step process to do the finish work on a patio. You gotta sweep it in, pack it, sweep it in, and then you can wet it down. Make sure that you're getting all that extra sand um, off the top before you wet this stuff down. Silica sand certainly can attach itself to the top of pavers and it leaves a real gritty finish on there and you can actually see it. it just looks a little bit unsightly. So at this point now, we've wet it down, right? And that's how, you, that's how you activate your silica sand. You sweep it in, you wet it down, and then you should end up with nice joints, uniformly filled. Um, this is probably a picture that was taken, you know, a few weeks after the install. Uh, we started recommending that we, to clients, you know, so many, so many people want to bring in sod, you know, it's like, let's bring in sod right after a job. We started recommending that seed is actually a little bit easier, so we include seed in the price of our patios now. We do not include sod in the price of patios, but long and short of it is, is you got to make sure that you're cleaning up around the edges here a little bit, and you don't leave that looking too rough when, you, when you're heading out from the job site. This is actually a project that I installed about two blocks from my house. This is a good friend of mine. Uh, I've spent many nights on this patio enjoying uh, our hard work, right? So these kinds of projects, you can get a little bit complicated because you gotta make sure that you're not running water at your existing features. So you can't run water towards your seat walls. You don't wanna run water right at the bar. You have to maybe create a little bit of a crown in there, do something a little bit different, right? But, um, this is one of my favorite projects. It's really cool. We have, we've actually got a gas burner on the right side of the grill, and then there's a separate gas fireplace over in that little cubby over off to the side there. Call it the VIP lounge, right? Um, <laughs> but really cool stuff you can do with these pavers. This is the slate stone product, and we did a Euro stone inlaid border. We also used black Euro stone inlaid around the bar. Okay. If I get five callbacks in a year, four of them are a, a paver overlay that we did. Does everybody know what I'm talking about when I say a paver overlay? So sometimes you'll be sit, putting a patio in and the front stoop is sitting there and it's just staring at you. It's ugly old concrete, right? So you can do what's called a paver overlay where you actually attach pavers to the top of that concrete. You have to check a couple things and make sure that you have room for the door to open, right? The door threshold has to be high enough or you might have to look at using a different product. But if you can fit an overlay in, this is a really popular thing. We sell overlays, I probably do 15 of these every year. We do a lot of overlays. One thing that kept on happening is we kept on having problems with our treads popping up. Has anybody ever had a callback for a stair tread popping up? It doesn't seem like a big deal. You go out and you, you shave off the glue and you re-glue it, and then maybe you get a call back again next year. Well, one thing that I think we were all guilty of is that we'd run our glue bead this way, from side to side, because it's easier. It's easier to just kind of go, phew, phew, done. Put your, put your treads on, glue it down. But the reason that we're advocating for a different system when you're gluing this overlay is because if you go side to side like that and the flow or the grade, the slope on the stoop is pushing water towards your glue line, 
you can see water build up behind your glue. When it freezes, it's going to pop some of those off, right? So now, if we've done our glue strips going this way, top to bottom, top to bottom, takes a few extra minutes maybe to apply the glue, but now you've allowed for water drainage to come through there. So you don't have to worry about creating glue dams, right, as you're gluing these things together. So um, we wanted to add this slide this year. This is something kind of new because we had a lot of feedback from guys that were having problems with this. Doesn't matter if you use the best glue in the world. If you're trapping water behind your glue, it's going to eventually give you problems, right? So make sure that you're thinking about that when you're doing your overlays.